Ciao and welcome to Geo's Paintbrush, where five minutes is all it takes to be blown away by one of the world's greatest artists. American pop artist Andy Warhol achieved a level of celebrity and renown during his lifetime that many more talented and influential artists never achieved. Warhol became one with his art, carefully crafting a persona, a brand, that, like his images of popular mass-produced items like Campbell's soup labels and famous individuals from pop culture like Marilyn Monroe and Elvis Presley, took on a life of its own as a valuable commodity and as an iconic representation of American life during the post-war boom decades of the 1950s and 60s. But what was Warhol up to? What were his intentions? This is a controversial question nearly 25 years after his death. To some, Andy Warhol transformed the mass-produced commercial art he developed for magazine advertisements early in his career into a bold and ironic statement about the decline of originality and creativity in modern society and in art, showing us all that we've become such slaves to mass media that a sharp guy peddling soup can labels and factory-produced portraits of the rich and famous can achieve the status of Michelangelo. With this interpretation, Warhol's art was a statement about the death of art, or of the artist. In a modern, technology-driven world, where television and radio and print advertising dull the senses and train the mind to respond favorably to the same old images repeatedly, and to find comfort and meaning in the familiar rather than in the new. But another interpretation of Warhol's pop art is that there was no irony involved. No mocking criticism of man's inability to distinguish Monet from Madison Avenue, and that this guy really loved this stuff, the common, the familiar, the universally recognized, and that he believed mass media and modern technology enabled artists to address masses of people from all socioeconomic groups, cultures, and walks of life in their work. With this interpretation, Popular art loses any negative connotation the word popular may hold in the tried and true academic world of art, and it takes on a positive meaning, an art that transforms everyday images around us into something full of color and life, worthy of celebrating and cherishing, if for no other reason than human minds created it for human consumption, and it's accessible to all, democratic with a small d a celebration of the technology and industry and creativity. Where do I stand on Andy Warhol? In today's show, we'll consider a 1985 silkscreen portrait by Warhol, Pete Rose, originally commissioned by the Cincinnati Museum of Art, now part of the collection of the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. I'll try to sort out my own understanding of Warhol, his purposes, and his influence. Thanks for joining us. On September 11, 1985, Cincinnati Reds player manager Pete Rose, before 47,237 fans packed into the old Riverfront Stadium, hit a 2-1 pitch from the Padres' Eric Shaw for a single into left field, notching his 4,192nd base hit, eclipsing the all-time career record for hits held by Hall of Famer Ty Cobb of the Detroit Tigers. And not surprisingly, to commemorate this monumental achievement, recording more safeties than any other player in the long and storied history of America's oldest and most important game, the Cincinnati Museum of Art turned to Andy Warhol and commissioned a portrait of Rose, who, with that hit to left, had achieved baseball immortality. Warhol, just two years before his death in 1987, did not turn to his usual inspirations for the portrait advertising imagery, or Hollywood-style photographs. Instead, he created a silkscreen of the already legendary ball player in an even more apropos style, mass-produced, universally recognized, and perfectly suited to the subject at hand, the baseball card. Employing his usual methods, Warhol took a photograph of Rose by Cincinnati photographer Gordon Bear and had it transferred to silkscreen. He then applied paint to a blank canvas before silkscreening the image of Rose onto that canvas. This method is known as underpainting, and it created unique color effects. Notice the unusual golden yellow color behind and above Rose on the otherwise purple backdrop. While the gold calls to mind sunshine, and one can see what might be glare from the sun on Rose's helmet too, 
on the back, the top, and on the C painted on the front of the helmet. The combination of gold and purple suggests royalty. The form of the gold touches, especially just behind the name on the back of the jersey, appears reminiscent of the seams on a baseball. The process also produced an interesting effect on Rose's jet black hair, outlining the form of his hair in red, and on his bare arm, also outlined in red, almost appearing to be electrified, or the arm of a comic book style superhero. The photograph selected by Warhol for the piece captures Charlie Hustle at the plate, bat cocked back and eyes wide open, focused intently on an approaching ball, probably just seconds before striking it. What does Warhol's portrait say about Rose? Well, there's certainly something there about the remarkable concentration Rose possessed when it came to striking a thrown ball, and of the energy level he brought to every game, electrifying fans and winning admirers, even of opponents for how hard he played on every pitch. But the thing is, Warhol could have captured those elements of Rose's character without the baseball card format and approach. So now we get to the crux of the issue. Did Warhol employ a universally recognized, commercially mass-produced portrait of Rose, one that probably existed fourfold in every kid's shoebox of baseball cards, costing pennies to obtain, to celebrate how popular culture in modern America is so democratic, so shared, so understood, so accessible, and perhaps to Warhol, confirmed by the countless thousands who cherish the image, so beautiful? Or, on the other hand, was there irony here, too? Was Warhol suggesting, instead, that in the modern era, we commemorate the accomplishments of our heroes cheaply, meanly, with works produced for profit and without originality, reflective of and reinforcing a consumerist society run amok? Certainly Warhol, by utilizing such a common format for his portrait, was commenting on the iconic status Rhodes had achieved with that record-breaking base hit. But what makes Warhol so difficult to assess is that he provides almost nothing to help one determine if he's creating art that's happily joining popular culture without reservation or mocking it. Well-known author and critic Gary Indiana, I'm guessing that's a pen name, has written of Warhol. Whether the soup cans and the staggering quantity of works that followed signified contempt or reverence, love or loathing, a mixture of feelings or an absence of any feelings at all, could not be gleaned from the paintings themselves. This enigmatic quality infused all of his work with a kind of empty secret. The soup can effect was not to rescue American banalities from banality, but to give banality itself value. While this strikes me as a less than glowing endorsement of Warhol's life work, to me, Indiana's criticism seems accurate. The empty secret Indiana refers to is that Warhol's works don't actually suggest anything about his subject matter, apart from the simple realities that they exist and that they are popular. There is no cultural criticism here, and maybe that was the whole point in the end, what Indiana calls the absence of any feelings and the embracing of popular culture, with the artist's role to reflect, not to question that culture and to even elevate the most mundane consumer graphics to the level of fine art, to commemorate our consumer culture without judgment, without comment, really without originality, like Warhol does with the portrait of Rose, well, I'm beginning to think that was Warhol's thing. Here we are, it seems to say, colorful, big, mass-produced, commercial, experiencing life without much thought and with little use for originality. We celebrate fame and fortune and all of the less exciting aspects of our materialistic society as art. And as for me, he says, I'm not saying it's good and I'm not saying it's bad, but here it is. It's you and it's me too. And neither of us seem to question who we are and what we've become, so there. In one sense, Warhol's work is art about art, in that he pursues an artistic non-vision, art that simply records what is, and the artist, rather than interpret or argue or even expose, isn't outside of the culture looking in. He's on the inside every bit as much as his subjects and the viewers, showing us who we are, the culture, the society, all that we've become. I think that's fascinating. But while I have respect for Warhol, I, for one, I don't place him as an artist in the master category, one of the world's greatest artists. Why not? I think his greatest limitation is that he's a one-trick pony, creating a lifetime of pop art that repeats the same non-message message repeatedly without end. There is no evolution with Warhol, no growth over time, no maturing. 
I get that one can't develop a more mature non-vision, and that given his purpose, he probably felt he couldn't change if his culture didn't change, and that he reflected his times. But to me, for an artist to truly be a master, he or she must offer more complexity than repetition, more originality than reporting, more insight than celebrity, a greater diversity of themes, and more growth as his or her artistic life unfolds over time. That being said, Warhol is an intriguing figure whose unique contribution to modern art will no doubt be talked about and debated for years to come. I can picture it like I could when I was small and it's so picturesque Looking through the crystal ball, can you picture this? And it isn't